As I talked a little bit about in our last episode, when we talk about folk beliefs, it is not necessarily to take them as though they are automatically false. Instead, one can decide to try to investigate the reality behind the belief. Or if you don't have the time and want to slap a TLDR on there, you can simply say, well, this is something they believe, but I don't believe it. And again, as I said last week, this is not an idea that I came up with. It comes from a 1977 paper by David Hufford. But let's develop this idea further with another concept I was introduced to by the fictional character Telesma Blue Orb in one of the entries from her diary correspondence that is basically too weird for me to share publicly. And that is the concept of lampshading legend now, the following are basically Telesma's words, not my own. But seeing as how she's a fictional character, I guess we could say that I channeled her in writing the following account. I'm just going to lampshade that in there. And also, while I'm at it, lampshade that I'm lampshading. Moreover, I'm lampshading that I'm lampshading that I'm lampshading. And... I think I might have stumbled on an infinite regress of lampshades. So let's put a pin in that. And let me just say really quick before we start, because Telesma didn't bother to do this for whatever reason. I don't know, maybe because she's an orb or maybe because she's a fictional character. Anyway, a legend is just a story that some people believe and other people don't. If we can't agree that King Arthur really existed, for example, we may call him legendary. Now, with the above lampshades in mind, Telesma writes, quote, Dear Rachel, I've come to realize that the term lampshading can be used at least by me or anyone else if they want to, I suppose, not just to describe fiction, it also has everything to do with UFOs. The term lampshading, or more technically, lampshade hanging, is a type of device used in fiction. From tvtropes.org, quote, This practice is also known as hanging a clock on it, hanging a lantern on it, or spotlighting it. In the film industry, it's sometimes called hanging a red flag on something after the screenwriting adage. To hang a red flag on something takes the curse off of it, meaning that to lampshade something decreases the negative effects it might otherwise have. Teodolinda Barolini referred to this as the Garian principle in reference to how Dante narrates how unbelievable his true story is the more fantastical it gets." Unquote. And the definition from Wiktionary.org reads, quote, to intentionally call attention to the improbable, incongruent, or cliched nature of an element or situation featured in a work of fiction within the work itself." Unquote. An example of lampshading is when Kermit the Frog points out that there's a running gag happening with the telephone backstage on The Muppet Show. Floyd Pepper comes and tears the phone from the wall, at which point Fozzie says, quote, well, I guess that's an end to the running gag, unquote. In Lucian's ancient Greek novel, A True History, he uses lampshading with ironic absurdity. As he describes in vivid detail the ranks of alien species in a great interstellar battle, he says of the Nephilocentaurs, colossal flying centaurs, that they were, quote, of such multitude that I was fearful to set down their number, lest it might be taken for a lie. And for their leader, they had the Sagittarius out of the Zodiac." Unquote. So what does lampshading have anything to do with UFOs? Well, the interesting thing is, listeners, most things have something to do with UFOs, because UFOs have to do with just about everything. And this example of lampshading is an illustration of that. I have lampshaded the incongruity of talking about UFOs in a narrative context by talking about UFOs in a narrative context. We'll leave aside the claim that I myself am in fact a UFO, but not without calling that out first as well. As we can see when discussing the relationship between fact and legend, 
It is often very convenient to simply lampshade where incongruities and whatever story one happens to encounter emerge. But simply because I have lampshaded the discussion of UFOs is enough to determine some connection to UFOs, however indirectly. The cautious listener will note that simply mentioning UFOs does not automatically form any direction to UFOs themselves, of course. Yet really, most any discussion of UFOs is not going to be directly concerned with any UFOs themselves. This is because a UFO report very rarely stands as evidence of some object unexplained to science moving through the air or through space, literally. And when it does, there is no way for anyone to know for sure. While there are those strange lights that are known to exist in the lower Earth atmosphere, such as the Heston lights or ball lightning, Quick aside, well, actually, I don't really believe this per se anymore, though in fact I did at the time that the fictional character Telesma Blue Orb was writing this. But in any case, what other types of unexplained physical phenomena in the atmosphere might exist is really outside of the domain of human understanding. So, Whenever anyone talks about UFOs, they are actually talking about the idea of UFOs. If I give an example of a UFO, any physically existing UFO, I am ultimately talking about a hypothetical, theoretical, or imaginary UFO. So in any discussion where we are talking about UFOs, it is often very useful to lampshade in accurate contextual information. And this is because whether or not UFOs exist as objective phenomena that can sometimes be observed by humans, all such UFOs, as well as any of the potentially fictional kind, only exist in legend for humans. There are not many long-lasting unexplained UFO reports, but those reports that do exist are legendary in some sense, because the true external stimuli that caused those reports cannot be identified. Previously, I discussed the idea of the human paranormal interface, describing it as a top-down faculty for processing legendary experiences. And I defined legend, not in terms of stories that people tell, but in terms of experience and perception, as opposed to legends that we encounter in the form of stories. In the school of psychology called Gestalt psychology, the mind's experiences are studied as a whole. The word Gestalt describes a whole that is larger than the sums of its part, sum of its parts. The human mind experiences the world not as individual percepts, but as a structured whole. For, exam for an example of this, in episode five of The Earth, Jeff Knox recounts seeing anthropomorphic mice in his bedroom. While these were almost certainly drug-induced hallucinations, he describes the mice as appearing in a particular location in his environment. If the hallucination was not placed in his perceptual environment, it might have simply drifted in and out of his field of vision or been partially transparent. Many hallucinations, such as seeing stars or auras, have no visual depth and simply appear over the three-dimensional visual field, moving with one's gaze. Why then should a hallucination appear as though a 3D object within one's external environment? I previously defined apparitions as a category of experiences that, like hallucinations, do not appear to represent physical objects or events in one's environment. But unlike other hallucinations, using my definition, apparitions are very personally meaningful to the individual, such as seeing a dead loved one or having a near-death experience. They are typically accompanied with strong emotions and may become an important episode in a person's accounting of their own life. However, in these types of experiences, objects and presences may again often be located within the experiencer's perceived environment. David Hufford gives numerous examples of how apparitions may be located within one's external environment, 
interacting with it, or even influencing the environment, such as by illuminating the surroundings by glowing. For example, from this first person account, quote, well, the first time I was at my girlfriend's house and I had, me, I had been sleeping, I went to bed early that night and I woke up, but yet I couldn't move. I was paralyzed, but I was lying on my back and I could see everything that was in the room. I could see my girlfriend sleeping on her bed and that's just the way it went for not long. It wasn't long when all of a sudden a bright shiny light came into her bedroom. It was like right at her bedroom door, just all of a sudden, it was there. And I just saw it and I just started screaming inside. I could feel myself inside screaming. And then all of a sudden I saw my girlfriend get out of bed. I saw her come over and as soon as she touched me, it was gone and I could move. And she said to me, what are you doing? And I just tried to explain it to her, but she couldn't understand it. I was scared. For the rest of the night, I was scared." Unquote. It is quite common in sleep paralysis experiences like this to hear reports of all sorts of details that place apparitions in one's external environment. This, along with how sharp and realistic the experience is, give the distinct impression that the one having the experience is awake. These experiences are also commonly terrifying or else invoke other deep emotional responses. They are gestalt experiences because the apparitions one encounters are integrated into one's perceptual environment and evoke deep emotions. This is all to say that while I may not be able to substantiate the existence of the HPI to humans proving that it exists, I can show that experiences of apparitions and hallucinations are often structured in such a way that otherworldly apparitions are perceived as a regular part of one's physical environment. Apparitions may appear to people just as anything else would. They are often placed in the world of the people who experience them. So whether or not the mind has evolved to specialize in fabricating legendary experiences, which I honestly think is more parsimonious at this point, we can say that human minds do with some frequency create fully lifelike experiences of things that can only be described as legendary. And when I say legendary here, I again mean legendary in a perceptual sense. What the mind perceives in these instances is at odds with the contents of mundane experiences appearing to have arisen out of some other world, such as an afterlife or a world of other non-human entities. And returning to the lampshade, legend is also, of course, a property of a story. If a story is generally accepted, then it's considered as a factual or non-fiction story. But if one cannot tell how much truth the story contains, if any, then it becomes legendary. The reports of people's perceptions are much the same as the reports from people's mouths. We can assign a value of accuracy or of reliability to any of them, and in any case, whether I perceive something directly or I hear it from someone else, I can only make a judgment of how probable the report is based on the available evidence. The UFO experience is not the experience of UFOs. It is really the report of UFO-like experiences that occurs in the mind's perceptions. It is quite possible for someone to think that they saw an unidentified flying object or even an alien spacecraft. It is even possible for someone to see the apparition of a UFO or some otherworldly flying light or object. But just as the reports of UFOs are all in some way legendary, the experiences of UFOs are in a more fundamental level, also legendary, just in a different sense. There are things that the mind perceives that may very well not be there or that may not represent what the mind thinks that they represent. Because of this, lampshading is very much deeply connected to UFOs insofar as lampshading is a very useful tool if we want to talk about and understand UFOs. 
Lampshading in this context simply means pointing out the facts of any given UFO case or even any given type of hypothetical UFO. It often just means pointing out what it is being discussed is a true story. The story came from this particular source and it exists in the historical or cultural context. Or if one is reporting their own experience, then lampshading may simply mean that they are stating that they are reporting their own experience and to take that as it may. I don't know if people actually saw luminous owls around Norfolk in the 1900s. This is a topic I'll have to discuss another time. But what I can say is that there are all of these different news clippings and magazine articles from the time, all of which report luminous owls. And the science supports the idea that barn owls rely on flashing prey with moonlight in order to stun them. So we can just put a lampshade on it and call it good. Nobody has to draw any false conclusions or assume that I believe that the stories happened as they were reported. And were reported. I've separated myself from the story by pointing out where it's come from and then treated the story as containing legendary components. To lampshade is to point out what we know about the legend, and that way one can more easily pick out the very muddy parts of the legend. Because of this, lampshading is actually a really invaluable tool for talking about UFOs. What do you think, listeners? What do you think, Rachel? Love, Telesma Blue Orb. Well, unquote. <laughs> well, thanks, Telesma. I love you too. And now I am very self-conscious. And I wish you had revised the, this letter more before you sent it to me. Fictionally speaking, you didn't really synthesize these ideas of lampshading, legendary stories, and legendary experiences very well, in my opinion, into a single cohesive composition. I even had to go back and add some of my own bracketed notes to the script, just so that listeners at home wouldn't get confused. But what I can expect from a not, but what, but what can I expect from a nine-dimensional bog light who's fictional? Anyway, as I mentioned from the outset, when we encounter a folk belief, say in the form of a legend that someone purports to be true, but that we believe, we believe is false, we can, as Hufford suggested, simply lampshade that fact. Or if I have an experience that doesn't fit with my other experiences because it's very uncanny or unaccountably strange. In other words, if I have an experience that is legendary to my own mind, then I can simply lampshade that. In other words, I can say, well, the weirdest thing happened to me the other day. I saw time inside of a bottle in a cloud or something. I don't know if this actually happened in my external environment or if it's just something that happened in my internal experience. But in any case, this is what happened, right? This is sort of like saying, I know it sounds crazy, or you're not going to believe me, but, and then talking all about the big fish that you caught doing inappropriate things in the bathroom. In this case, we're not lampshading fiction. To, in this case, we're not lampshading fiction to point out that it's a fabrication, but we're just doing the same exact thing with an experience, except to point out that it sounds absurd, but it nonetheless happened in some sense, lampshading a legendary experience. <laughs>